Thanks for joining me today on the See Jane Build podcast. You're listening to this because you're either in the process of renovating your house, are about to do a remodel, or are thinking and dreaming about doing one. Or maybe you have a piece of land and you're going to build from scratch. Have you had a child, gotten married and planned a wedding? Renovating and building is a bit like those things. You don't do them very often, in the case of a wedding, hopefully only once. But until you do them, you don't really know what is involved or how to approach it. And you don't know what you don't know. It can be overwhelming. There are so many things to think about, from how to really know what you want or need in your new kitchen, bathroom, whole house remodel, to how to go from idea to completion without tearing your hair out, hating your house, or if you're married, hating your spouse. If you have watched any shows on HGTV, they make it look so easy. Sure, there are surprises along the way, but it always works out in the end. Well, as you know, that's just TV. In life, it's much more complicated. I want to be clear, it's totally normal not to know the process or what to expect during a renovation or build. Renovating and building are big deals. It's normal to feel scared and stressed, to be worried contractors or architects may take advantage of you, to stress over the budget or over how long a project will take, to constantly question if the decisions you are making are the right ones. And as women, it's sadly very normal to feel like a fish out of water in the construction world, which seems to still be very much a boys' club. But take a deep breath and know that C. Jane Build has got you covered, and so you've got this. The more you know before starting, the more educated and informed you can be, the smoother the project will go. And a smoother project takes less time and costs less money. C. Jane Build will be here every step of the way, helping you know what to expect and how to prepare for it at each point in your renovation or new build journey. Be prepared, though. We are going to be spending a lot of time talking about things that are not the pretty glossy images of kitchens and spa bathrooms and seemingly endless outdoor areas. Photos and visioning and style are super important, don't get me wrong, and we will spend a fair amount of time on all of that. But it's equally important to go beyond the pretty and get into the practical. The practical of how you live in your house, how you want to live, how you can pay for getting from one to the other, plus how to get from one to the other. The process and the practical are what make the pretty possible. So let's begin. How do you plan, budget, hire a team, and manage a renovation or build? First, let me ask you something. Vacations are great, right? What's not to love except maybe all the laundry you need to do as soon as you get home? And yes, I know all of our vacation plans have been altered the past couple of years thanks to COVID, but just bear with me here. How do you like to plan your vacations? Are you the type that spends a lot of time researching? Has your days mapped out weeks before you leave home? And has all your dinner reservations made and tickets for things like zoos or shows booked in advance? Do you hate planning and deciding, so you always go to all-inclusive resorts or have a travel agent plan the entire trip? Or do you prefer to totally wing it? You go somewhere, but then figure out day by day what you want to do? Chances are how you would plan your vacation is a bit like how you would enter into a re renovation if left to your own devices. And let me tell you, if you are a wing it type of vacationer, you would be in deep renovation trouble very fast. But don't worry, that's why you're here. Unlike vacations, if you don't have a really clear sense of the journey before you start and you are just going step by step, the whole process will be inefficient and take loads more time and money than is necessary. There are three broad stages of any renovation or build. Dream, design and define, and do. I'll explain a bit about them here, and then future episodes will go more in depth on the ins and outs of each stage. The dreaming stage is fairly self-explanatory. Most of us dream about our dream homes without even realizing we are doing it. Let's face it, any time we are at someone else's home for the first time, we are subconsciously taking in their choices, comparing them to ours, and evaluating them. At least I hope I am not the only one doing this. And I don't mean it in a snarky, negative way. For example, there's a woman I know from Brooklyn who renovated her home before moving into it. 
I never saw the before, or frankly, the house she lived in before, only the after, this newly renovated place. And she explained to me what she had done. It was the first time I had seen someone add in a second dishwasher, which seemed like a crazy luxury. But she didn't do a full second one. She just added in a small dishwashing drawer so she could do a fast, small wash of something when she needed to. I thought that was really, really cool and interesting and filed it away for future reference. You might think that the dream stage is all fun and games. You get to look at images and videos and decide what you like and what you don't. But it is so easy to get overwhelmed. And like when you become a parent for the first time, Everyone you talk to in this phase will have an opinion on what they think you need. Not to mention that most of us, when we drool over house pictures, are not necessarily thinking, I love this, but how would it fit in my budget? You also really need to keep in mind how your house needs to work. Yes, our home should be our sanctuary and respite from the world, but it is also a workhorse, or should I say, a workhouse. You might love the look of a complete wall of glass, but if you live in Minnesota, where it seems like it's always winter, that might not be the best choice. In the dream stage, besides saving images that they like and thinking about the aesthetic of their house, I always ask people to do a home audit. It's a questionnaire worksheet about how you and your family live in your house. The goal is that at the end of the dream stage, you not only have a clear vision of the style of home that you want, but also the way it needs to function. Ultimately, all the work that you do in the dream phase of a project gets you to a creative brief document of sorts that you can use for phase two, design and define. I hate to say this because it's not going to sound very dreamy, but during the dream stage, you also need a dose of budget reality. We will, of course, go into budget much more in detail, but at this point, you should have a ballpark of what you can afford to spend and where you are going to get that money. You do not want to get in front of your skis, as they say, and set yourself up for failure from the very start by not having some idea of the money you can spend on your renovation. In the design and define stage, your ideas become a plan. This stage is crucial to get right. Because once you hit the do stage and the first hammer is swung, you are no longer planning. You are just responding and reacting. Design and define is when you hire and work with an architect or a designer to bring your vision to life, though sometimes you might only need a contractor and someone to draw plans. At the end of this phase, you should have a set of plans and detailed scope of work that lets you solicit bids and go into the actual build with confidence. Do is another fairly self-explanatory time. In this phase, the work is happening. Bids are solicited from contractors and a builder is chosen. They, and his or her employees and subcontractors, are on site, doing the things. But don't think that you get to just sit back and eat bonbons until it's move-in day. Nope, you still need to be really involved. But let's back up a bit. Before you even start the dream phase... In addition to thinking about your budget, I strongly recommend doing a bit of house reconnaissance. Whether you are planning a remodel on a home you currently live in, one you just bought or are thinking of buying, but you need to renovate it before you move in, or you have a plot of land and you're going to build, there are things that should be thought about now before you clip any photos of cool kitchens or talk to a single architect or contractor. And I'm not talking about doing a house audit which is critical, and while where I'll ask about how you live in the house and how you want to live, that'll come a little bit further down the line. This here, I'm talking about some nitty-gritty facts about your house and you in it. The first thing is, what do you see as the shelf life of your house? Is this a starter home that you see yourself growing out of in a few years? A forever home? Something in between those two? There's no wrong answer. It's all about your lifestyle and your life needs. But what the answer is impacts renovation. If you think you are going to live here for, say, only three to five years and then sell it and upgrade, you definitely want to keep that in mind when planning. You'll want to think more about resale in that case and only make changes with that end in mind. That's not to say you should settle for a less than renovation. You can still make a house functional and beautiful and a joy to live in, but you might not want to make personal choices that the next homeowner could find questionable. Like, for example, a really cool but super unique backsplash tile. 
or this special tricked out area in your laundry room to give your four dogs a bath. Conversely, if you think this is your forever home, you want to do everything you want, but you might decide that you have to do things in phases from a budget perspective. Even if you have no plans to move anytime soon, it's always helpful to get a sense of what the homes are selling for in your area. It would seem a bit foolish to invest, say, $500,000 in a home that you bought for $250,000 in an area that the highest sale has never been north of $600,000 and where people are not actively renovating. Yes, there are, of course, exceptions to this, but it does bear keeping in mind. When we bought our land on the North Fork, we had this very issue. We wanted to build a modern house, which was rare in that area, and while we planned to use the house, we also planned to rent it out as a vacation home, so we did see it as partially an investment property. The value of the house we built was higher than the other homes in our immediate neighborhood, but the whole area was on an upswing, so we felt okay about that and confident that values would rise. But then a year later, we decided to totally change our life and move to California. We weren't upside down on the sale of that house, but had we been able to hold it longer, we would have done much better. The next thing you need to think about, and I know this is not fun or sexy, is what is allowed in your neighborhood and what hoops will you need to jump through to make your project happen. Every city and town has some rules about building, and most projects will need permits and have to conform to certain building guidelines. It's just a fact of life, so the more you can suss out before you even start dreaming of your home, the better off you'll be. And I'm not talking about building codes here, which is the minimum standard of how certain systems like electrical need to work in your house. I'm talking about the town guidelines on what you can build and where. For one thing, let's say you live in a one-story house and you want to add a second story. Even if there are other houses on your street that are two or more stories, even if your next-door neighbor has two or more stories, if your house is currently only one level, check first to make sure you can go up. While logically you should be able to, there are all sorts of seemingly nonsensical rules and easements that might apply. Also, a big issue that you may not know about is setbacks. This is the amount of feet between any given edge of your property and where you are allowed to have a structure. For example, where I live now in California, I can't have any structure within 30 feet of my front property line, 15 feet on the sides, and 25 feet in the rear. Your front property line is usually, but not always, the street where the front of your house is. So if I wanted to expand my house, I'm limited to how far I can go in any direction, and like I just mentioned, there may be height limitations too. Do you have a homeowners association where you live? If so, they may have additional rules that you need to adhere to, even down to things like what colors you can paint the exterior of your house. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about permitting and land use rules because it can be so different from city to city, but a couple of things to keep in mind. You won't always need a permit. Let's say you are just refreshing your kitchen, maybe new cabinets, appliances, adding an island, but without any plumbing or electrical work. Then you may not need a permit. It's important to know from the get-go if you will need permits, and also how long they typically take to get in your town. With COVID, I think there's still a backlog, so factor that in as well. In some places, a permit can take as little as a month or two, and other places, it could be a year. Yes, I know, that is beyond crazy, but it's a fact. Another fact is that in some cities, like New York City, for example, the process can be considered one of the seven rings of hell. And in cities like that, it's common for people to have to hire an expediter to manage the permit process. Don't worry if that's the case. Chances are your architect has one on staff or they work with one frequently, but you need to be able to plan for that, especially since that will add a little bit to your budget. In keeping with our current theme of things that are not exciting but are important to think about, you should seriously consider getting a home inspection done before you start down the path of remodeling. I know, you're saying to yourself, Those are just for when you are buying or selling a house. But think about it. A home inspector will be able to do some due diligence on your house that you yourself can't do and identify issues that could be a big time and budget suck if they were surprises once the project started. For example, if there's mold or asbestos that you can't see, or if any of your systems, like electrical or plumbing, 
are truly outdated and should be updated or need to be updated to bring it up to code. While a home inspection will cost you a bit of money up front, it has the potential to save you money in the long run, sort of like if you were to buy travel insurance for a big trip. More than that, it allows for better planning and, as I said a minute ago, limits the chances of big, unwelcome surprises. That's not to say there won't still be some issues that can arise, because even home inspectors can't see in walls, but it will definitely help alleviate a lot of potential problems. Another important thing about now, before you truly start down a renovation path, is will you live in the house during the renovation? Obviously, the scope of the project will dictate this a bit. If you're doing a gut reno and taking a house down to the studs, living in it is impossible. But if you were just doing a room or part of a house or even the whole house, depending on the degree of changes, you could possibly live there during. For example, there's a house a couple of streets over from mine where they are currently doing a big project. But the project involves an addition to the house. So even though there was a ton of work being done every day, and I imagine it can be quite loud, the addition is sort of a separate entity So the construction is not affecting the living space and the family has not moved out. Of course, if you're doing a new build or if you are renovating before moving into a new house, ignore this next minute or so. But the rest of you, which is likely most of you, think about it from a financial and sanity point of view. On the financial side, it will add to your budget to move out for the duration of the project. Even if you have someplace you can go where you will not need to pay rent, Say your parents or in-laws are a very good friend who somehow has extra room for you and your whole family, there is still the expense of moving things, whether it is to temporary storage or to a temporary house. And if you move it to storage, don't forget you'll have the cost of the storage for the duration of the project. But by moving out, the builder has unfettered access to your space, which will allow him or her to work more efficiently, hopefully saving a bit of money, or at least making things less likely to drag out and thereby cost more. It may also save some sanity in a very stressful time. If you are living in the house, you will need to contend with dust and debris constantly, no matter how good workers are at cleaning up at the end of each day. Plus, there will be some noise, some part of every day. If you have kids, either scenario, moving out or staying in your house likely means you are living in smaller quarters than you are used to, and if you're staying in your house, you may not have access to your kitchen. Privacy will likely be non-existent. Can you imagine six months, eight months in that scenario? If you listened to the first episode of this podcast, you know that when we first started dating, my husband was renovating his house. That renovation was planned in a way that he did not need to move out. He just had periods of time where he couldn't access certain rooms of his house which worked because he was just one person living there and he had a rental apartment in the bottom he used as an office and it had a small kitchen he could use. So he was good to go. Just really think through your options and what is feasible for you financially and emotionally. Sorry if what I have said makes me sound like a Debbie Downer before you have even started, but it is all really important information to think about. Remember, the practical and the pretty. I promise that this podcast and subsequent See Jane Build resources will always be real about the work it takes to get to your dream home. You know what? I just decided that I hate the expression dream home. It's the renovation equivalent of saying that you are looking for Mr. or Mrs. Wright and that there is just one soulmate out there for each person. Yes, if you are renovating or building a house that you plan on living in for a long time, I want it to be as close to perfect for you as possible and have everything you desire in it. But unless you're made of money, chances are you're going to have to compromise on certain things. The goal should be an awesome house you love living in, but that doesn't mean it's the ultimate dream home. I know you guys can't see the air quotes. I love the house we lived in in Brooklyn, and I love the house we built in the North Fork, and I absolutely love the house I live in now in California. It's my favorite of the three, but there are things about each one of them that I would change if I had a magic wand, and I bet in five years there are different things that I would change if I was still living in each one of them. Okay, but but I digress. Hopefully, at least a part of you is super excited about renovating. You should be. It is exciting, except when it's not, and I hate to tell you, it's not a fair amount. 
Be prepared to make hundreds of decisions, maybe thousands. And a lot of the more fun ones don't come until a little further down the process when you're kind of feeling decision making out. Which means, actually, let's talk about mindset for a minute. If you have school aged kids, you may have heard the term growth mindset over the past few years. It's basically the concept that skills and talents can be developed and mastered and are not innate or fixed. In school, Mindset affects how you approach tasks, challenges, and setbacks like algebra or playing the recorder. I feel for you fourth grade parents everywhere. In the renovation world, mindset is key. In a traditional remodel mindset, a homeowner likely goes into the process thinking, for example, that the relationship between the general contractor and the homeowner is a win-lose scenario. They, the GC, are out to somehow just make their money and screw me over. And yes, they're going to do my house, but somehow I'm going to get the short end of the stick and it's going to be a bad experience. We'll talk much more about GCs in the future. But here I will say that if we can shift our mindset and prepare for the relationship better, it can and should be a win-win. Plus, in any project, things are going to go wrong or if not wrong, at least not according to plan. Accept this. The key thing is to understand this and to have a sense of how you will react when it happens, aka mindset. Back to the contractor for a second. Will there be times your contractor is empowered to solve a problem on his or her own, or will he always need to talk to you? How will you want your contractor to communicate any issues that arise? You don't need the answers now, but you will need to talk about them before signing a building contract. Same thing for your architect as well. But again, we'll go into this in much more detail. Is your head spinning? That's not the goal, of course, but I want you to know as much as possible up front so that you can plan thoughtfully and pragmatically so that the whole process goes as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. So you end up in a house you love, and feel confident and competent throughout the journey to get there. In our next episode, we will talk more about the dream stage and how to start your project in a way to best set yourself up for success. Then later this season, we'll work through getting from dreaming about your new space to project completion and move-in day. Hope you join us.